Pepsi Cola for vodka, he said. Yes, sir, said the Pepsi president, and they shook hands on a deal making Pepsi Cola the first American consumer product to be made and sold in the Soviet Union. The Soviets uh, are generally concerned about the problem of alcoholism. This is what Kosygin constantly talked about. Uh, and he wanted a, a product that he thought might divert the people from consuming alcohol uh, and asked a lot of questions about PepsiCo and how far he could ship it and the shelf life and that type of thing and talked a lot about alcoholism. Matter of fact, when I, when I saw him after we opened our first plant, I told him I didn't think we were very successful because we opened the plant in Orosisk and we went uh, by hydrofoil down to Sochi in the Black Sea. And we arrived at the, the pier and the mayor made this big speech upon our arrival and announced with great pleasure to me that the number one drink in Sochi had become Pepsi-Cola and vodka. Kendall understood one truth that communist countries could best serve American interests as monopoly markets rather than as adversaries. Pepsi's Russian deal was announced within two weeks of Nixon's re-election in 1972 and was perhaps the effective beginning of a pragmatic foreign policy called detente. It became the symbol of, of detente. Uh, and a lot of Soviets have, uh, have said this to me, that. The only thing that they saw, the visible thing that they could, that could see, was, was Pepsi-Cola that, that started during this period of, uh, of, of detente. But while businessmen like Kendall saw detente as a means of serving American interests, Ronald Reagan saw it as an obstacle to establishing total American superiority. Let us not be satisfied with a foreign policy whose principal accomplishment seems to be our acquisition of the right to sell Pepsi-Cola in Siberia. Reagan, of course, was no chimp. He'd been selling things to the American public for a long time, such as stay press shirts, soap, the delights of smoking, and making a fast buck. But is he a Pepsi president? Or is he, like his predecessor, a Coke president? Carter, a Georgia boy, was very much a Coca-Cola president. He appointed one of Coca-Cola's lawyers to be Attorney General of the United States, and the then chairman of Coca-Cola, Paul Austin, shuttled unofficially and often secretly between the White House and President Sadat, Fidel Castro, and P. King. Carter acknowledged the political power of Coca-Cola when he said, we have our own built-in State Department at the Coca-Cola Company. They provide me ahead of time with penetrating analysis of what a country is, who its leaders are, and what its problems are. Jimmy Carter was good old, a good old Georgia boy. Grew up, became governor of Georgia. But during the war, he was in the Navy. In the summer of 1942, he had been um, appointed by his congressman as a candidate for the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. Of course, the appointment's one thing and getting it being qualified is another. Jimmy Carter qualified in all respects except his feet. He had flat feet, at least at that time. And his mother told me when I was on a visit down to Plains, Georgia, that the that he finally qualified uh, concerning the flat feet because he spent that summer before the final uh, uh, physical test rolling the soles of his feet over Coke bottles. In running for president, Jimmy Carter was Coca-Cola's man. Tony Schwartz, the advertising man who had made 300 commercials for Coke, was brought in to help sell Carter the candidate. To Schwartz, Selling an image of a politician was no different from selling the image of a soft drink, as long as you kept to the rules and didn't mention what the product contained. One of Carter's first acts as president was to change the soft drink vending machines in the White House. Out went Pepsi, in went Coke. Then there was Portugal, where Coke had been banned for 60 years. Carter obliged Portugal with a $300 million loan, and Coke was into a new rich market. However, 
the big payoff was China. And not even Mao, who had kicked out Coke in 1949, could hold back the tide of sugar, caffeine, and Doc Pemberton secret juices, for which a billion gullets beckoned. An American medical group warned Deputy Premier Deng Xiaoping, don't do it. Few American food products are more injurious to health than Coca-Cola. For China to have Coke is irrational. But the Chinese, who alas had only happiness cola, wanted the real thing. That was 1978. The Soviet Union, China's principal foe, had just signed a friendship treaty with Vietnam. The Chinese reacted by concluding two alliances. First, with the standard bearer of American commerce, Coca-Cola, and two days later, with the American government. Coke politely waited a week to announce the deal formally, so as not to upstage Carter, when he announced America's recognition of its once most hated enemy. The fact is that for a number of years, prior to the official recognition, uh, you know, governmental recognition between the People's Republic of China and the United States, operating under the laws of the United States, we sensed that sooner or later, I mean, the handwriting was on the wall, that the relationship between the United States and China would begin to open up. It was beginning to open up. Mm -hmm. And the company began to attend uh, trade fairs uh, in, uh, in China, began to uh, start some actual trade with various uh, agencies in the Chinese uh, government, began to uh, develop relationships, began to get them acquainted with our kind of system. When the Chinese government said, we would like to talk seriously about opening up a franchise, they were making judgments about their relationships with the United States. And it was logical for them to come to someone who, with whom they had established a decent relationship to be one of the first. And uh, aside from that, there was no hidden agenda and no uh, basic communication between the Coca-Cola company and the, and the U.S. government on that issue. We were abiding by the laws of the land. Coca-Cola started negotiating with the Chinese very, very early. Now, were you pre-Kissinger? We were six years ahead of the actual uh, uh, recognition where it was agreed that embassies would open up. Six years prior to that, there was contact between the Coca-Cola company and, uh, and uh, people in the Chinese government. To understand the moves and fortunes of the Coca-Cola company is to understand much about American foreign policy. Coca-Cola quietly shut down its operation in South Vietnam well before America's hurried departure in 1975. Did Coca-Cola know something even Washington didn't know? The Coca-Cola company is, uh, and its product is absolutely non-political. And we do business with any country that, uh, that the U.S. government will do business with. We're a U.S.-based uh, company. From a personal point of view, uh, I believe that the best way to get to know people who have a different political philosophy than you, and perhaps the best way to encourage uh, world harmony, is to establish world trade. Because people who are, find some way to do business with each other uh, tend to be able to iron out some of their other differences. So that uh, uh, when we do business in, in communist countries, uh, we don't sacrifice any of our principles. <laughs> there are no mean people in the world, just thirsty ones. No really bad guys, just guys who are hot and tired and bugged. Coca-Cola can take care of them. There's something good-natured about the taste of Coke. A sort of uh, get-the-chip-off-your-shoulder niceness that lets the real you shine through. In fact, you could say, the special kind of goodness in Coke brings out the goodness in people. Both Coke and Pepsi are heavily invested in Latin America, and their local franchise operators, which are not subsidiaries, and therefore not directly responsible to headquarters in the United States, can virtually do what they like. 
The franchise operator in Guatemala in the 70s was John C. Trotter, a Texan who believed that godless communism had infiltrated everywhere except the Coca-Cola company. Guatemala has one of the world's worst records in human rights. Death squads murder and torture with impunity, while four out of five children suffer from malnutrition. Trotter paid his Coca-Cola workers less than $2 a day, and when they began to unionize, three union officials were murdered and two union lawyers were kidnapped. Coca-Cola means crime in Guatemala, a union official.